Welcome to the Women in Public Policy Program Seminar Series Podcast at the Harvard Kennedy School. Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Victoria Budson, the Executive Director of the Women in Public Policy Program. As many of you know, here at the Center, we focus on how do we close involuntary gender gaps in the areas of political participation, education, economic opportunity, and health. And today, we're joined by the Connors Robb Professor of Business Administration at Harvard Business School, Kathleen McGinn. She's one of our affiliated faculty. She works with us regularly. And she is one of the key individuals within the sector that really focuses on women and economic opportunity and looks at how do we design key interventions to close gaps for women and girls. Today she speaks about It Takes a Family and a Country, and she will walk us through her material. Would you prefer to take questions during or at the end? Sure, during this time. Um, during, and uh, you will often read about Kathleen McGinn's work, not just in academic journals, but also in the popular media. It's been featured in the Boston Globe, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and we are so pleased that she's part of our community. And I turn it over to Kathleen. Thank you. It is wonderful to be back talking about this research. A couple of years ago, I presented a very, a very, very preliminary version of this with just a little teeny bit of the data and got lots of wonderful suggestions. So I'm quite hopeful that um, this round will produce more of the same. This is um, still work in progress. So please feel free to make any suggestions, ask any questions. Um, all of your questions will make the work better. So thank you very much for coming. So I'm going to talk today about work that will gradually evolve into two papers. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that I'm going to throw at you. Um, slow me down or speed me up at any point in time um, that it seems reasonable. But because there's so much data, let me first tell you what I'm going to tell you at the very end um, in case that we have to speed up to get there. So as the title suggests, um, we are looking at role models and how those role models affect economic and more broadly welfare outcomes of both women and men. And we're thinking about role models at two levels, role models at home, so it takes a family, and role models at the country level, it takes a country. We operationalize role models at home, non-traditional gender role models as working moms, so I'll tell you a lot more about the data in a minute. But think about working moms as the response to this question, did your mother ever work outside the home for pay before you were 14 years old? So it's before you were 14, it's ever, um, in whatever way someone might interpret ever. So possibly someone might interpret ever as a day, but it's very unlikely. But it doesn't mean that your mom was a full-time um, away from home mom. So it's a, it, as we think about it, it's a really weak test because there's lots of variation on this variable and very strong results that I'll show you. <coughs> that at the country level, we're looking at female parliamentarians. And we tried to look at female heads of state, but it turns out there's just not enough variance in female heads of state. And so we look at the proportion of female parliamentarians, again, before you were 14 years old. So averaged across your life between the time you were born and 14 years old, What's the proportion of female parliamentarians in your country at that period of time? Okay, so, so that's the non-traditional gender role models at the country level. What we find is that for the non-traditional gender role models at home, these improve women's outcomes in the workplace, and I'll give you lots of details about that, and they increase men's participation at home. The flip doesn't seem to be as true, so it has, um, working mom has much less effect on what women do at home, although a little effect. And um, working moms have very little effect on men's outcomes at, at work. So it, it appears to us to be a true role modeling effect. What is it that women see at home? Women see a working mom handling things, and I'll talk more about this. And um, their sons see, um, hopefully, um, much more um, distributed work at home, and so start to participate in that. At the country level, the results are somewhat weaker, and the strongest results have to do with um, what happens at home. So female parliamentarians, it looks like, have some negative effects on workplace outcomes, 
and then I'll show you those, but very positive effects on outcomes at home. So again, it looks like a role model effect, that it's reasonable for men to be participating in um, activities at home, and it's reasonable for women to be sharing those activities as role model at the country level provides. So that's the overall story of what I'm going to tell you at all. So we were driven to this research, uh, as Victoria talked about, by really thinking about what drives the gaps in outcomes between men and women. And Christine Lagarde last year said, the 21st century poses many challenges that require a new way of thinking. And she went on to say that none are more important than the economic role of women in the changing world. She laid out three areas where the economic role of women needs to be uh, <coughs> studied and changed. And that is what she called the three L's, learning, labor, and leadership. As we know um, from lots of recent research, women's learning, um, in the sense of formal education is doing quite well. So across the developed countries, women actually have more education than men. They do better in school than men. And this goes all the way up um, to the postgraduate levels. This is much less true in the developing countries. So um, some of you have seen me present some work where we're studying education outcomes for girls in Zambia and looking at the effect of negotiation training on those education outcomes. In the developing world, girls still receive much less ed education than boys, but in the developed countries, this is flipped. So we're not gonna look at learning from a traditional perspective, but rather think about what learning goes on in the household. So again, thinking about learning as a role model effect. And then we'll look at labor in terms of um, the likelihood of employment, the, like, the earnings that you have relative to everyone else in your country if employed, and your likelihood of supervisory responsibility is our measure of leadership. We also, um, because much research has suggested that um, if we don't change what goes on at home, we're never gonna get equal in terms of what goes on at work, we also look at outcomes at home. So rather than looking at just sort of total aggregate hours <laughs> spent at home, we look at hours spent in household work and hours spent in family care. And it turns out that these have quite different um, effects on earnings. So I won't talk about the effects on earnings here, um, but just a quickie that how many hours you spend doing housework has a negative effect on your earnings. Across all of the countries we study, hours spent in family care have either um, no effect or a positive effect on earnings in the sense that higher earning people tend to spend more hours a week in, in family care. Um, and that may be because they have more hours a week to do so. So if we think about um, the differences in income, let me explain this graph to you because you'll see a few of these. So I'm studying uh, these effects across 25 countries. These are data that were provided by the International Social Studies Program um, that's run out of Germany. The data are collect were collected in 2002 and in 2012. And they're collected across about 31 countries. We use the 25 countries where all of the data that we wanted to look at are available. Um, for each country, we look at the differences between male and female in many of our variables. Sometimes we'll look at the difference between years. Sometimes we'll look at the difference between mother worked and um, stay at home mom. So for each country, you often will see two different variables. And then on our y-axis, um, our y-axis is always explained over here. So in this y-axis, what we have is the standardized income. So it's standardized by country by year. So we take everyone who responded to the survey in that year, and we put the mean at zero, standard deviation at one. And what you see here is that for every country, this isn't working, for every country, women make less. Oh. Is it working it's now? It's got a mind of its own. <laughs> um, <laughs> for every country, women make less, that is, it's lower. So this is zero is right in the middle here. So anything below zero is, a sta is below the mean, anything above zero is above the mean. So what we have is women in every country making less than men. There are some countries where it's more even than others. Um, so in, in ways that you wouldn't be surprised, we see in the Slavic countries, we don't see women's income being so much lower than men's. I, I'm, I'm sorry, in the Nordic country countries. And we also don't see it in the very low income countries. So it tends to be that in the real low income countries, you don't get that gap because everybody's making so little. 
So this is what we're trying to explain. We do know that gender inequality, so we can see between 2002 and 2012 that gender inequality is shrinking, but it's shrinking somewhat unevenly. So this is the, um, this is just for women. So everything is below zero. So the zero line is right here. So for women, you can see that in most countries, with a notable exception being the US, um, women's income relative to the income of women and men um, is getting, the gap is getting smaller. Can I ask you a question about that? Sure. So did you see like a different differential effect of the uh, financial crisis on, on women versus men? Like have you been able to see that in 2008 and see something? Yeah, so it's a great question. I wish we could. The data are collected only in 2002 and 2012. So for those of you who don't know ISSP data, it's a fantastic data set. They collect data every year. They collect it um, across about 30 countries every year. But what they collect every year is different. So they first started collecting the gender-related data um, in 1988. They collected it in 88, 94, 2002, and 2012. So we don't have these data for, from this data source. We can look at it at different Um, inequalities are also widespread in the private sphere. So you can think about the public sphere being the workplace, the private sphere being home. And what we see here are the hours, let me see if this is more, no. The hours spent weekly on household tasks, and this goes from zero hours to 40 hours a week. And what you see is that across all of the countries, we see women doing um, more work at home than men do. Again, in the Nordic countries, this is more equal. What you also see is it tends to be that the more developed the country, the less time is in aggregate spent at home. And what we see is basically, as you bring in things like dishwashers and wash machines, um, you have to spend, you don't have to spend as much time at home. So What's Mexico, the for example, between household, has been high. household tasks and family care? Yep. So this is just household tasks. Yes. So there are, yeah. So there are two um, separate questions. The question for household tasks is how many hours a week do you spend on? And it's shopping, laundry, cleaning, household repair, and one other task. <laughs> what am I saying? What do you do at home? Cooking. There's cooking. cooking. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> you go. <laughs> and cooking. In, um, for family care, the question is how many hours a week do you spend caring for family members? Um, for all of the family care analyses I'll show, we only include people with children, but people without children have non-zero family care as well. We don't include those in these analyses. And all the data is self-reporting. Right. All the data is self-report. So one of, the, um, one of the things that we did to look at, especially the within household data, is we looked at the country level and we said, okay, on average in this country, how many hours do women say they spend um, at home? Mm -hmm. And then men were asked, how many hours does your spouse spend? Mm -hmm. And women were asked, how many hours do your, does your spouse spend? Mm -hmm. And what we found was that um, women, women's reports of men's hours were roughly the same, they're not significantly different. Men's reports of women's hours were significantly different in that women were reporting fewer hours than men were reporting for their spouses. Yeah. And I've seen other studies that show men tend to over-report, and this isn't a critique, this is just what the, what the data describes, exactly. that, that men tend to over-report household care and that women tend to under-report their household care. So that, that yeah. seems in line. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, and there's um, some recent research around 2012 that compared all of the various ways that you can collect data about mm -hmm. household work. So some of it's self-report, some of it's time diaries. Um, and it tends to be that across these methods, the numbers are roughly the same. So, so it's not it's not a perfect measure, but it's capturing That's something. Pretty good. Yeah. Are Close. agricultural households included in this? I'm sorry, say it again. Are agricultural households included in this? Yeah, great question. So, the ISSP every year um, tries to and does pretty well um, a stratified random sampling at the country level. So across urban, suburban, rural, across income levels, across districts. Um, and I'll show you the numbers. Um, we have roughly 
um, in countries somewhere between 500 or, and 1500 per country. So, you know, it's not it's not a great number, um, but they try to have it be a pretty stratified example. So um, the thesis from which we're working is that gender inequality at work and at home doesn't reflect anything hardwired about men or women, nor does it necessarily reflect only things that are um, policy related at the country level, but rather reflects individual attitudes, reflects experience that people have had in their lives, reflects the bargaining that people do at home and at work, and reflects um, the legal and social cultural influences in the broader society. Um, so we consider childhood exposure to women providing non-traditional role models, and we explore the association between that and outcomes in the public sphere and the private sphere. So our research question is whether, and we know this by this point because I told you the answers, on whether it affects employment, supervisory responsibility, earnings, allocation of household work, and care for family members. So. You can think about this as our model, um, but this model has only direct routes. I'm going to talk a little bit about what we thought would be a mediated model in the sense of what we know about um, gender role models at home is that they affect gender attitudes, and so we believed that there would be some mediation there. Uh, there is past work on the role of non traditional gender role models at home, um, so we know that we know from a very few studies, but that working mothers do affect um, the allocation of household work. This appears to work through the male, even in um, the few studies that are out there before ours. Um, and in an interesting study that used an instrumental variable, Fernandez and her colleagues looked at uh, the proportion of men who were sent away, or who, who went to war in World War II and used that as an instrument to say how likely was it that women in that area were going to be employed during that period of time. And then used that to say what happened to their son's spouses. Now why they went with their son's spouses instead of just their daughters is a little unclear to me. But they look at the effect on their son's spouses and it, what they find is that men who were raised by using this instrumental variable, um, women who worked were more likely to be married to spouses who worked as well. Um, we also um, can think about non-traditional gender role models not just as working moms but housekeeping dads and there are some studies that look at the um, men's allocation of their, the allocation of household work to um, dads and it looks like these make kids gender attitudes more liberal. It looks like this lasts a long time so it affects not just the immediate um, gender attitudes but affects gender attitudes when these kids are adults. It also, um, there's quite a bit of research on gender attitudes. It looks like gender attitudes get pretty fixed um, by the time you're an adult. They, became, they become somewhat more liberal with some shocks that I'll talk about and somewhat more conservative with things like getting married and having children. Um, but in general, your gender attitudes are pretty well shaped by the time you're an adult. Um, at the society level, the evidence is um, much sparer. There is an interesting study that in the U.S. that looked at media coverage of female politicians, and what it what those findings suggest is that, to the extent that there's media coverage, this does affect teenage girls' or gender attitudes around politics, mm -hmm. but it appears to affect it through conversations at home. So it appears that the mediator is whether it's sort of discussed over the dinner table. Um, in a recent study um, by Esther Duflo and her colleagues, they looked at the random assignment of a punchayat in India. So um, India has put essentially quotas on um, the proportion of villages, you can think of them as cities, that have um, female mayors. It has to be once every three years, or once every three election cycles. Um, and what they find is pretty remarkable effects on uh, gender gaps in terms of attitudes, and pretty good effects in terms of um, what actually goes on at home. 
And what they see is that, that the villages in which there were multiple years of female mayors, that the gender gaps and aspirations actually go away. So, so there, is, there is some evidence that non-traditional gender role models at a societal level make a difference. Notice that this is um, mediated by what's going on at home. So you can think about that as a role model effect. It's not simply that you have women running, but how you discuss what those women running mean. And Duflo and colleagues actually end their paper by saying, because it seems to have very little effect on things like employment outcomes, we're assuming that this is actually a role model effect. That's their words, um, not mine. Can it, mm -hmm. Is there, is it important that these um, societal role models have a public political? I'm just wondering why, you know, if you had a society where it, it, all of the doctors were women or the truck drivers were women or something, it, it, it's, is it the, pu the public nature important? To yeah, this? it's a great question. Um, so it's both a question of the practicality <coughs> of research right. and the visibility of the people. So, so in terms of the practicality of the research, uh, it's very hard to get good numbers, historical numbers, of women across these industries. Uh, the other thing is, it's hard to figure out what numbers. We thought about doing things like CEOs, but if you're using a representative sample of the population, like, how, like do people really know what proportion of females, I mean, we do, right? The people in this room do, because we keep repeating the number over and over again, <laughs> no matter how depressing it is. Yes. Um, but, but, it was hard for us to come up with an argument about why women CEOs somehow were going to make a difference um, across across all of society. You could think about things like female professionals that everybody sees. So doctors, but it's, it's really hard to come up with something that's as visible. The other difference between these, and I think it's um, it ties into your question, is this is much more um, immediate. All right, so mayors tend to be much better known at a, at a sort of visceral level than people at the uh, national level. Um, but there's very little research out there even with this, um, and, and actually none that I know of that looks at it at, in the private sector. So uh, the way that we think these non-traditional role models work is that they shape what people think is appropriate behavior. So if, you're, if you think about um, different ways of thinking about how gender works, you can think about it as a biological model, you can think about it as a socialization model, you can think of it as a pure exposure-based model. That is, what I see, I come to think about and believe as normal. And so that's the approach we're taking here. Did this just change colors? It's, it's the monitor is on its way out. Ah, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it looks very fancy. Yeah, it does. I kind of like it. Um, so, so traditional gender attitudes essentially place men and women in separate spheres. So women's sphere is at home and men's sphere is in the workplace. And you can contrast that to more egalitarian gender role models where women and men share the homemaking and the um, sort of workplace roles. And of course, this is a continuum. Um, there are some that argue that this is actually not a continuum at all, but two separate scales. We're going to treat it as a continuum. It's the way that it was asked. And I'll tell you a little bit more about the, about the specific questions. I, I can tell you that it's very hard to find cute cartoons <laughs> about men and women sharing roles, and this is my favorite. Um, <laughs> there we go. So, so what we proposed is that the gender role models in the family are actually going to work through gender attitudes. We'll start with that and go from there. Um, these are the data. I think I've talked about all of this. These are the countries. So this goes to your question of how many observations. So it's not because they carry it out every year and a survey. These surveys are done in person in the household. So the surveys take a couple hours um, and they cover lots and lots and lots of questions. Um, the one thing to note is that post-Soviet countries, the numbers are quite small. Um, the post-Soviet countries are interesting um, for other studies we're doing with these data 
in these analyses, if you drop them, you don't get anything different. Mm -hmm. no. You don't, uh, in the data set, do you have single mom? Yes. Also, as well? Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and as I go through the analyses, I'll tell you who's included in which analyses. For the, for the workplace analysis, or for, I'm sorry, for the home analyses, we only use people who are in, in couples. Yep. So here are the characteristics. Um, it's a little over half female, around 40 years old. Um, religion is a categorical variable. The most important thing is that the, um, the omitted variable is no religion. Um, so, and, and you'll see the rest of religions as we go through the analysis. Uh, married cohabiting, about a little over half. A um, little over half have children. Um, about a third have little kids at home. About half are urban. Um, over 50% had their moms worked before they were 14. And the average proportion of women in Parliament when they were under 14 was around 11. Um, note that all of these with the double asterisks, um, the difference between men and women is significant. Um, highly significant. Because we're looking at around 50,000 observations, um, we, we, we use cutoffs at 0 .001. If the cutoff is any lower than that, I'll tell you. Um, just we're running so many analyses and we have so much data, um, 0 .05 would be a fishing expedition. Um, in terms of employment, you can see a major difference between men and women. Over 80% of men and not quite 70% of women are employed. Um, again, this is the standardized income. So men's income um, is generally above the mean. Women's income is generally below the mean with about the same standard deviation. Um, in terms of supervisory responsibility, again, we get much higher supervisory responsibility for men than for women. Um, women put in lots more hours of household work and lots more hours of care. So these data are I think as you would expect. And again, men and women are significantly different on all of these. So now the question is, do the non-traditional gender role models matter for all of this? Um, so we'll first look at gender role models in the family, and I'll use this to explain um, not only the outcomes for this, but essentially how we looked at the data. So I'll go a little bit more slowly through this analysis than I will through the rest of the analyses. Um, the gender attitudes are measured with these 11 questions. Um, so some of them are um, sort of agree, strongly, disagree, strongly agree to strongly disagree. For example, men's job is to make money, women's job is to look after the home. Um, some of them um, are the reverse. So working mothers can have a warm relationship with their children, just the same as um, mothers who stay at home do. And then a couple of the questions have to do with um, what do you think women should do? So what do you think women should do when their children are under school age, and what do you think they should do when the youngest starts home in terms of whether they should stay at home or go to work? Um, we ran a, um, ran a factor analysis on this. They, they load together quite well. Um, the alpha is 0.77, and so we kept them together. We have run some separate analyses looking at these as a separate um, group of questions because they really are getting at what seems to be a somewhat different construct even though they're highly correlated with this. I won't go into those analyses. They don't seem to um, say much different. Um, so here are the gender attitudes. And the thing to notice, basically, um, is that for the most part, and again, these are, these are Z-score, or I'm sorry, these are standardized scores because it's a scale, and some of the items on the scale have different measures. I'm sorry, have different scales. And so basically what you see is that women tend to be a little more egalitarian. So higher is more egalitarian, lower is uh, more traditional. Women tend to be a little bit more egalitarian than men um, across most of the countries. So, so the, the average is cross country then? Because like in Russia they're both below zero? It's across, across all of them. Yep, so it's standardized sort of around the world. Would there be a reason to standardize it within country? No, no, I, yeah. I just thought income was within yeah, the country. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Well, because be income yeah, is for a good in rubles yeah. and dollars. Yep. Yeah. 
Yep, so, so very good question. This is across all of the data, where do these countries fall? So that you can see, for example, that Norway, if you look at it relative to the rest of the world, is much more egalitarian. And you can see that Mexico, for example, is much more traditional. Importantly, if you just look at the left-hand side of the graph, if you look at male and female, you can see that females are much more egalitarian than males. This is the sample of people whose moms stayed at home full-time. This is the sample of people whose moms were employed. So mm -hmm. you can see a, a whopping difference here. Mm -hmm. So that even for the men, if your mom's employed, you have more egalitarian gender attitudes than women whose moms stayed at home. And this is across the world. And Kathleen, you had indicated at the beginning of the talk that for the men who grew up in a household where the mother was employed, so we can see they're likely to have social benefit, and then their spouse, so to speak, would likely be able to earn more money, presuming that then their value system carried into the household. So if it's a dual earner income household, they may see an economic benefit from a household perspective, but there's no particular benefit to them and their career looking at the economics of it. Is that right, from what you said? Yep, I'll show you that, but that's right. Yep. There's no, there's no harm, no gain. Right. Yeah. So you can, s so this is mom at home and mom employed across the countries, and what you can see is that this holds true in every country. So for every country, if your mom was employed before you were 14, you have more egalitarian gender attitudes. So we will control for country level effects, but this is this essentially doesn't vary at the country level. So. The reason I'm showing you all these numbers is because I'm doing it just once to show you what I did. Um, so that, uh, so so we run a mixed <coughs> we run a mixed effects model, which means we control for essentially um, the country level effects and the country level women in parliament. So these are random effects. Everything here is fixed effects. Here are the other religions we look at: Christian, Jewish, Islamic, um, Buddhist, Hindu, and other. Um, in terms of gender attitudes, what you can see is relative to people who said they have no religion or practice no religion, um, with the exception of Jewish, everybody else is more traditional in terms of their gender attitudes relative to people that they said no religion. Again, unsurprising, we know that religious activity tends to be correlated with um, more traditional attitudes around all whole sphere of things. Um, Older people are less egalitarian. Married people, it doesn't matter. Um, you become less egalitarian once you get married. I'm sorry, once you have children. Um, I'll, I'll show you some good things about um, caring for family members, but there's quite a bit of literature that suggests that households, and all of us who actually went through this know this, households have what they call a shock to the system once children come into the household. So it's not about the caring for household, or caring for children per se, but it does rearrange things in the household. And part of the way it rearranges it is it um, makes you sort of fall into traditional gender roles. Um, people in urban areas are, are more liberal, um, more liberal over time. So I won't show the specifics on this, but um, in almost all of the countries, gender attitudes are becoming more traditional. This, I'm sorry, more liberal between 2002 and 2012. This goes counter to some um, research that suggests that things are stagnating. Uh, from what we can see, things are getting better over time. Uh, women have more uh, egalitarian gender attitudes. And <coughs> for those of you, um, for those who were raised by a working mom, more, much more egalitarian gender attitudes. So these are the kind of analyses we'll run on everything. I won't show you the rest of the um, regressions. So first we're going to look at employment and supervisor responsibility given employment. So this is the likelihood of employment, the difference between women and men. And we see that in most of the countries, there's um, women are less likely to be employed than men. Um, again, in the more egalitarian countries, that difference is minimized, but it's still there. Um, so for all of these, what I'm going to basically show you is just the, the marginal effects, controlling for everything that I just talked about. These are the marginal effects for having been raised by a working mom. So what we can see is that if we look at these, um, so that this color really starts to, so this is a red line, these are females. This is a blue line, these are males. 
So for males, this is a non-significant effect. Um, but for females, being raised by a working mom, controlling for all of those other things, increases your likelihood of being employed. And while these look like steep lines, um, the effect, for some reason, um, is most significant on females, um, that, the, that being raised in a, raised at a time where there were higher female parliamentarians increases your likelihood of employment. Oh, it went away. <laughs> okay. So now we look for those people who are employed. Um, what's the likelihood of supervising other people at work? And again, we see that women are much less likely to supervise than men are across across all, all of our countries. And again, controlling for everything else, what we again see is that the effect of having a working mom is flat for men and in, um, significant and in increasing for women. So those, those who are raised by a working mom are much more likely to um, supervise others at work than those who were raised by a mom who stayed at home. The effects of the female parliamentarians is negative um, so that the more female parliamentarians when you were a kid, the less likely you are to supervise others, and we're trying to sort out why that is. So what we see, we had this up here. Gender attitudes are not mediating, mediating these effects. So well, I don't have the regressions in here, so I can't show you. But gender attitudes are always significant. But the effects for working moms and the effect for female parliamentarians stay even after you put gender attitudes in there. So gender attitudes are definitely affected by being raised by a working mom, but that is not the full effect. It seems that there is some kind of modeling going on. I don't just change the, what I believe, I change what I know and what I know to do. So there's some sort of skill-based thing that we think is going on here. So there's a direct effect of gender attitudes and a direct effect of the gender role models. Now if we look at income, you've seen this number, and what we see is that being raised by a working mom, again, has no effect on men's income, and it increases women's income. This is a little bit lower than the significance level that we've seen on other things, 0.009. Um, this effect is <coughs> mediated by gender attitudes. So if you take gender attitudes out of the equation, this is a whoppingly steep effect. Mm. Once you put gender attitudes in, the effect for working mom remains <coughs> significant, but not significant at the same level. Was there enough single female head of households with children in the sample to show statistically significant effects? So if I just run it only on single women. Single female head of household. I can run, I haven't run that. Yeah. I think that could be interesting. In some countries, I won't have enough data, but I can yeah. pull out just those countries that have enough data, I can check that. Mm -hmm. yeah. What's your hypothesis there? <laughs> <laughs> That's the kind of thing I would want to, before I, I would be careful about making a, a narrative and a story before I saw if there was data that supports there's a narrative or story. So in my mind, I would try to not think too much in advance on that. Mm -hmm. um, but a couple effects, when I think about looking at wage data, for example, when we looked at the countries and attitudes, interesting to see the US's attitudes compared to other countries, for example, and looking at attitudes and wages, mm -hmm. since I spent a lot of my time focusing on wages. Yeah. Uh, we now know that every major city in the US is or will be majority minority, for example. And what we also know is that single female head of household with children is huge. It's, for example, Boston. A proportion of, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah Most cities. children of Boston will grow up in single female head of household. Yeah. And if we're looking at what, um, and you're saying there is an effect mm -hmm. on whether or not there's egalitarian values, mm -hmm. well, if the woman, by definition, is the breadwinner mm -hmm. and the caretaker, right then in essence it's no longer about whether or not it's viewed as equal, it's really viewed as only. Only and how can she handle it? So I think what the, what 
what we see beyond gender attitudes mm. is not about beliefs and equality, but rather about figuring out how to cope. Right? So if yeah. your mom worked when you were a kid, you see how she does it. And what brought it to mind is you talked about skill building effects, yeah, right? Exactly. Yeah. And children who <coughs> grow up in households, I presume, with one parent yeah. and a single female head of household, to some extent I'm gonna presume there's skill building and competency taking place for the yeah. children. And then you can map it onto anecdotal things like, yeah. you know, past two Democratic presidents have both been male, grew up in single female head of household, both had to develop a skill set where they could both be personable, they could be effective in school, they both had some effect of idolizing the mother and therefore that translated into policy, which is therefore yeah. of interest yeah. here for us. Yeah. You know, how do we create male leaders who have a lens towards um, productive, what I would view as talent management and productive equality policy? Yeah, so what we don't have So that's what's running in my mind. These respondents' mothers were single head of household. We have mm. whether the respondents are mm -hmm. single head of household. So I can see whether the effect of being raised by a working mom is different for women who are in two person head of household at four one, two mm. two parents one. But I can't see whether you were raised by mm -hmm. a single mom. It would, be, it would be good to see, Interesting. But I, don't, I don't have those yeah. data. Um, in terms of gender inequality, I'm sorry, in terms of income inequality, what we see is that for both men and for women, um, the proportion of female parliamentarians when you were a child is associated with lower earnings. And again, we're trying to figure out what that is. So what we see is, Again, direct effects for employment and supervisor responsibility on um, role models at home. Um, for women, positive effects of employment on role models at the country level. Negative effects for women and men in terms of supervisor responsibility and earnings. The effect of um, role models at home for earnings only is mediated partially by the gender attitudes. Now, on the, on the part you couldn't quite explain about having more female parliamentarians yeah. and lower earnings. I mean, I don't know the data for when this cohort was 14 and younger, but if you look today at the IPU data of who has the highest proportions, there's a lot of really low income yeah. countries in there, and I wonder yeah. if it's a correlation. Right, what, exactly, is, yeah. the, is that compared within country? Right. Or is that comparative to the mean of? Yeah, so what we do is, <clears throat> Um, so we have the random effects for country, we have the random effects for female parliamentarians at the country level, at the current level of female parliamentarians, and then we allow individual fixed effects for female parliamentarians when you were a kid. Okay. But so there is, but I completely agree with you that there is something going but on in there. it's within country? Or is it between? So it's, Cause, it's cause across countries controlling for the random effects of current level of female parliamentarians. But I think what we need to do, and I think this is what you're alluding to. That there um, are more parliamentarians who are female in nations where the barriers to entry, um, and that this is somewhat skewed now by quotas, but where the parliament is um, part-time or underpaid or low status, which usually means so what, economy. Yeah, so what we can do it. with that, and what we haven't <laughs> put in yet, but we're going to put in um, essentially gender inequality indicators at the country level. So we just got all those data from separate data sets. So, so we're trying to figure out whether we should put gender inequality data at the time you were under 14, mm -hmm. or at the current time, mm -hmm. you, might try, you might try both. But I completely mm -hmm. agree with you that there's something like that going on there. So if we think about gender inequality in the private sphere, we know that it's affected by gender inequality in, I'm sorry, gender inequality in the public sphere, we know it's affected by gender inequality in the private sphere. So um, Hannah and I have a paper that looks at this as a two-level game, that your negotiations at home are affected by and affect your negotiations at work. And there's this recursive system between um, what's happening at home, gender attitudes, and what's happening at work, and then back again, what's happening at work, gender attitudes, and what's happening at home. And we're going to try to um, tease this out <coughs> and separate out work and family care. Um, 
The allocation of household work has quite a bit of research around it. The, the earliest research was based on Becker's model that thought about the household as a monolithic um, decision maker. In essence, everybody in the household wanted what's best for the household, and you stayed home if it was best for the household, you went to work if it was best for the household. Um, we've somehow since the 80s grown to realize that probably individuals in the household might have their um, individual preferences that aren't necessarily all aligned at the household level. And so more recent models allow for differences in preferences across, um, across decision makers in the household. Uh, this work suggests that relative resources and time availability have big effects on how the allocation of household work is determined. And so we have a separate paper where we're looking at that as well. These things, um, relative resources and time availability, interact with whether your mother worked or not. Um, they study for a separate day. Um, there's also quite a bit of work that shows that um, what's going on at the country level affects what happens within people's households. Um, what I think is the interesting piece of this and what um, Hannah and I thought was the interesting piece of this when we looked at bargaining at home as a two, or sort of career home bargaining as two local games, is that negotiations at home are a ripe setting for essentially turning understandings of, of roles. And so I think it's a, a very important um, place to study even though we don't think of it necessarily as a place of economic outcomes. In, in practice, it affects economic outcomes. Being raised by a working mom, and so here we start to see this um, interactive interaction effect. So for women, being raised by a working mom reduces the number of hours you spend in household work. Um, it increases the number of hours that um, men spend in household work. And these effects also hold for female parliamentarians. So for men who were raised in countries where there were uh, more female parliamentarians when they were kids, they tend to do more hours of household work. Women, fewer hours of household work. Caring for family members is actually quite different. So if you think about um, the economic explanations they hold for housework and for um, care work, but there's very different cultural expectations about caring for family members. And so we can, if we think about separating these apart, we can think about a number of reasons why we would expect different effects at e within each country. Um, unlike household work, hours of family care are actually increasing. Um, and this, this looks to be true across most of the countries that we study, and this is in spite of the fact that there's many fewer um, kids per household than there were a couple decades ago. It's increasing for both women and for men, and the <coughs> increase for men is substantially bigger than the increase for women. So with household work, it's going the opposite way. Men are doing more, women are doing less. Um, and women are doing much less than men are doing more, but that's because we have, we have sort of labor-saving devices coming in. Um, but for house, for care, both people are doing more. No, in family care, the, so this isn't data that includes um, care of aging parents. This is of children. It does. So, so the question is, how many hours a week do you spend caring for family members? Okay. And we cannot differentiate between aging parents um, and kids. Uh, what we do is we include, all, in the analyses I'll show you, we only include people who have kids at home. Okay. So they may also have aging parents, but it's probably um, much less likely than if we look at the whole sample. We could restrict it to an age range, sort of 40 and above, that would have um, aging parents. We didn't do that, well, but we could do that. With, you know, with there being more aging Especially in certain countries, yeah. people are living longer. So right. That right. Is, might explain some of the increased hours. Uh, interesting. Most of these studies, so I call this family care, almost all of these studies are just caring for kids. Okay. Our data includes both. Most of these studies oh, are I basically see. just caring for kids. Sorry. Okay. Yes. Do you see a difference between the profession of the parents? So we have very um, sort of gross <coughs> industry measures. So I don't know the industry. I don't know the actual professions of these people, and I don't control for it. 
the defect also be explained by if, if a family has more children, the, there are age differences between the children, so the older children can care for the younger children. Is that an effect? Um, it it could be. What it looks like when you look across these studies, and some of these are ethnographic, um, much more qualitative studies, it's just the um, the expectations around parenting have really changed in terms of how much time you spend with the child. Um, I think everyone in this room is younger than I, but you know, I'm one of five, and basically it wasn't like we were all within seven years, so it wasn't like anyone was taking care of anyone else, but it was pretty much, you know, it's like go outside and play. Right? <laughs> and it, wasn't, it wasn't like we were being driven to this and that. And, you know. and even the language, the term parenting, the idea that parenting was an act rather than just a state of being <laughs> before you were a parent. But if you look at sort of the linguistic yes. constructions, like parenting is a new term. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it's yeah. a yeah. Do you have a sense where that, like what bucket those hours were in prior to being shifted into to care labor? I mean, is it is it now that younger younger children in the household have to do fewer hours, and those hours have accumulated to the mother and father, or that it's shifted away from their like formal labor hour allocation? It's a really good question. It's shifted away from housework hours. Um, so, so if you take the housework hours and the family care hours and you add them together, that doesn't seem to be changing very much. And so what you'll see is, well, well it's washing machines and refrigerators or something. Like yep, yep. So, and, and so part of the reason that mothers used to say go outside and play was that they were really busy um, and, and they didn't have Trader Joe's. <laughs> so, so it, it was a very different allocation of time when you didn't have all this. So, so what we see is that being raised by a working mother equally increases women's and men's hours spent in family care. So unlike allocation of household work, where ha being raised by a working mom made or sort of taught women how to do <laughs> less housework and men how to do more housework. Being raised by a working mom increases both men's and women's time that they spend with their kids. Interestingly, gender attitudes are not related. And you can think about this as um, sort of reasonable. The more traditional people think that that's their role, they're supposed to be parents, and the more egalitarian people think, you know, oh, I should be spending time with my kids so that I can teach them, you know, how to be sort of liberal like me. So, uh, so, so what you see is nothing for gender attitudes and positive for both men and women in terms of a working mom. In terms of um, female parliamentarians, no effect on women whatsoever. But countries, kids, boys raised when there were more female parliamentarians tend to spend more time with their children. So what we see is um, not a mediated model, but rather an additive model of non-traditional gender role models and the effects on public and private sphere outcomes. So for women, being raised by a working mom increases, oh, this is touching it, increases your earnings, increases your supervisory responsibility, both if you're working and increases the base rate at which you're likely to be working. Um, for men, it affects their outcomes at home, so it affects the amount of time they spend in household work, more time spent in household work, more time spent in family care. Um, for women, it also affects these, but it reduces the hours that they spend in household work. So in some ways, you could think about this as a, as a good news, good news story. So there are very few, um, what I think of as sort of magic bullets around um, reducing gender gaps, but it does look like being raised by a working mom is one of those um, magic bullets. So it increases women's um, outcomes in employment, doesn't affect men's, it increases men's contributions at home, um, and to the extent that you're talking just about household work, decreases women. So the gaps here are reduced, and the gaps here are reduced by, reason, by being raised by a working mom. Gender role models at the country level um, appear to be somewhat more mixed with negative outcomes in terms of supervisory responsibility and income for both women and men, but positive outcomes when we think about um, outcomes at home, mostly for men, but for women as well. All right. That was <laughs>
So we haven't. So we we actually discussed doing this, but because we have people in here up to 60 years old, so we only include working age people, so we include 18 to 60 year olds. We would have to go back to the media presentations when they were 14 years old, and so we'd mm. have to go back um, 60 years of media and collect it every year. So that's probably impractical. Um, but I think what we can do is go in and put in the Women's Empowerment Index um, for those countries by year. It's not perfect, so we spent the last couple months trying to get all of the data across a whole bunch of indices to, oops, to, to deal with essentially this question. Um, and we have it, it's a little bit spotty in some countries when you go back prior to World War II. Um, it's especially spotty for obvious reasons in the post-Soviet bloc countries because they weren't countries. Um, it, they weren't countries until much later and so we don't have perfect data for it, but we'll run um, tests with as many controls as we can to try to get at that. Because you're absolutely right that just having women in parliament doesn't mean that's viewed as a positive thing by society. We need to somehow figure out how to get that disentangled. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you might want to look at how these effects and mechanisms might different, di different, be different across income levels. Because I imagine it would be really interesting, perhaps in like a few countries in the U.S., maybe to do a case study of what these look like at different income levels, except, and also like kind of what those narratives are. Yeah. So, so we do have um, the paper we're calling "Babies and Broomsticks," but people tell me that makes them think about witches. But yeah, we're thinking yes. about babies. <laughs> so we'll, we'll probably change change the, the name of that paper. Um, but what we what we do in that is interact working mom with income and with hours worked. And and you're absolutely right. It also um, tends to vary by the type of country that we're in. So in those analyses, what we do is we look at the gender attitudes at the national level, both the um, absolute level and the change over time. Um, and it looks like in the more egalitarian countries, the effect of having a working mom sort of doesn't, it's, it's basically just about hours and income. It's not about that interacting with working moms. But when you get into what we call the stagnating moderates, countries like the US, for example, and the stagnating conservatives, um, countries like Mexico, um, what you see is that being raised by a working mom has a significant interaction with income and hours worked and this is on what happens at home so so your intuition is right um, what we would love to be able to look at maybe this is implied in your question is the income of the household in which you were raised um, so with my co-author Mayra Ruiz Castro um, we are we started a big study in Mexico Mexico is a huge outlier here it's an outlier on a whole bunch of dimensions it's very, very conservative. It's one of the few countries where women's gender attitudes are more conservative than men's gender attitudes. Um, it's one of the few countries where uh, both hours spent in household work and hours spent in family care are very high. Um, and so we're working with 10 companies in Mexico to try to see the extent to which what happens at work can affect what happens at home. Um, and there we're able to look more closely, first of all, at interactions with individual level income, and we're able, we asked questions about the household in which you were raised. So how conservative was it? Um, was it, a, did you have a single mom? What was your, so we have these sort of status rules, rulers of things, and we don't have those data all in yet. So I imagine, I mean, there are certain communities where being a stay-at-home mom and having a partner who does all the work from the bacon be a status yeah. symbol something yeah. we would aspire to. Yeah, yeah. It's also, Mexico's interesting mm -hmm. along with a few other countries. There are some fairly low income countries, the Philippines is one of these, for example, where you don't have to be very high income to have lots of help at home. Mm -hmm. so, so in Mexico, once you're just barely above the poverty level, then you start having household um, help. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to disentangle the role of that as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm on that same, uh, same vein, uh, one of the things that strikes me is that actually it would be really interesting to look at that is, is on 
have institutions in those countries. Yeah. I mean, there's this whole literature on yeah. male welfare state, yeah. uh, moderate male yeah. welfare, uh, breadwinner state, that's what it's called. Yeah. yeah. And kind of the, the welfare order that's yeah. in place. Is there child care? Isn't there child care? Yeah. How long is the, the daily hours of time kids spend in school? Yeah. Uh, when do they come home? In other words, is the, yeah. is this, is the is society organized in such a fashion to make women's labor force participation easy or not? Yeah. And, and the post-Soviet countries, in a way, are really interesting. Really because interesting. Because yeah. they, they, it's such a nice natural experiment yeah. to kind of look at what was in place in the West and what was in place yeah. in the East, which had vast amounts of childcare, right? There's yeah. also women working was such right. a normal thing. Right. And um, so, I mean, it just strikes me yeah. that, that that should matter. And that would be a, a, an interesting way to get at these very issues also. It doesn't matter that there's parliamentary yeah. women, parliamentarians or yeah. not. So these are the types of data we're trying to collect. You yeah. can't collect them for the post-Soviet. Yeah, because that's a problem. It, yeah, <laughs> right. Um, because they didn't collect data at that level. One of the things you're talking about, and this is, um, it, this was striking. In fact, I we, I went back to the data. I'm like, these can't be right. Um, so so we have the um, proportion of women who are currently working because we have those data, and we have the proportion of people who report that their mothers were working. And in these Soviet mm. bloc countries way higher proportions reported that their moms were working than currently work, which for me is a flag, right? How can that be? You know, but it's true it's for true. almost all of those countries. Um, and so it looked like that should be, um, that could be a boundary condition for these effects. It doesn't appear to be, but I agree with you. Those mm. countries are really interesting. And there's not that much data on them. We don't have that much data on them either. Um, but it would be interesting to pull them out and look, the, look at them separately. They tend to be, um, when we, in this babies and broomsticks, they, they tend to cluster in the um, stagnating conservatives. So they're, they're changing very slowly. The one country which is bizarrely different than the rest is Slovenia. I don't know if you've looked at it. Yeah, Slovenia is like a Nordic country. It's just, I have this Slovenian friend who's like this power woman. She's the uh, um, a TV broadcaster and she's like, she's now a tenured professor. She's got kids, she's just fantastic. I'm like, because you're Slovenian. <laughs> <laughs> have you, or would you have the data to be able to tease out like, the effects of um, the father being, like, say, a dad or doing the primary yeah. housework? I wish we did. We don't have it. If you know of any data sets that look at that um, internationally, I would love to see them. I, it's not asked. Even in the 2012 data. So, so the questions got more refined. It's really quite an interesting study just to look at the gender attitude type questions that they asked in the 80, 88 one, the 94 one, the 2002 one, 2012. There's a whole study that you can think of in terms of international uh, narrative around gender just from those questions. But even in 2012, they don't ask if the dad stays at home. About the um, impact of female parliamentarians question, mm -hmm. did you, con I'm just thinking there would be correlation of that with having women in other high profile positions, not as public, but like, um, you know, the children may be more likely to have a female professor, a female yeah. doctor. Yeah. So how do you control for, yeah. unless those, you have specific, some of the quota countries, they may not have other prominent women, right? So but then you have to kind of get at just you know parliamentarians. Yeah. So so we have over the last couple of months um, collected the data all the way back on to the extent that it's available on what they call female professionals, and so we can do so, we can run some analyses with those. We do have um, everything about female head of state. And again, those are those are. It, it's, it's just such sparse data, almost everything's a zero. So then we looked at whether there were women who had run for office and gotten in the final runoffs, and even that is too sparse. Um, so that we can't use very much. We do have um, women in C-suites. That's only reported in some countries. So we're going to try with these new data to try to um, to try to see if we can understand this effect a little bit better, mm -hmm. um, but I don't know where it's, I don't know where it's going to lead us. Um, those those numbers, by the way, tend to be 
the number you're talking about in terms of female professionals and female parliamentarians. Um, controlling for nothing else, they're actually negatively correlated. So there's, but I would think in certain countries, like Northern Europe, they'd be highly correlated. Yes, so yeah, then, across the 25 countries, they're negative. Right. So that might be just getting at your, yeah. you have really mixed countries. You have highly yeah. correlated yeah. gender equality. And then you have these other countries that are really practicing like affirmative action, just in their political camps. Yeah. And that's going to, yeah, interesting. So what we could do, which we hadn't thought about at all, we could essentially go in and find out whether there's a quota. It's easy to and do. just put in right? a dummy for yeah. a quota. Yeah. Because I, I think yeah. it's the mechanism. The mechanism may have a really significant. And I would actually do, do it both with quota and then what the quota reserve seat, like what that mechanism <laughs> is. Yeah. Because the mechanisms actually make it pretty significant. But they're also just really different pools of ones with female parliamentarians. So you have ones yeah. that That's have really very strong gender equality yeah. indicators across. Yeah. So there's different mechanisms going on in those countries. There are ones that have strong quotas yeah. but um, not high yeah. other yeah. I think and yeah. so those yeah. are you know to group those in yeah. might be yeah. but and we could treat them as we could treat them as separate. Mm -hmm. Or we could at least interact quota with the percentage. That's a great idea. Did the pe were the people asked if there were female representation? No. That's a totally separate data set. Because my expectation, I mean, most people have formed their political identity by the time they're about 18 mm -hmm. to 20. Mm -hmm. So whether people are politicized or not, and all the data shows that it does come from what was discussed at the dinner table, basically. Yeah. Um, this is before they're 14. So those are the numbers we're reporting here. I, like, I think Esther and Rohini's work is spectacular, but I don't think it's likely broadly applicable because it was very specific, not about sort of gender norms as much right. as it was about in those communities, would they want their daughter to do something political? Right. And it might not right. have had. Yeah, those questions really were about I mean? political activism. Oh, I'm just so inspired by the whole lunch. It's really exciting to yes, be here. Yes, I hope it's taking away this mother's guilt thing. There's right. nothing yes. to feel guilty about. Yes. Right. Well, ours, our um, sister, Marky, is uh, with the Canadian Olympic Committee, but she raised her two young girls with uh, women doctors. And when they were a particular young age, they turned on the television and saw something quite unusual and turned and said, Mom, look, a men can be doctors. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm really quite intrigued with the impact of... Um, women sportscasters and weather women and all this and media yeah. presence normalizing the expectation. But my that's one uh, point that really fascinates me. But another is I, I did run federally, but now I'm very deeply engaged in running boot camps and training camps and orientation camps for large numbers of women in Canada specifically. Thinking about it um, and then eventually engaging in it and how you get in to win. And do you change the game or does the game change you? And then it's very intriguing to me, anecdotally, not yet um, quantified, but the numbers of women who now are entering into this arena, what modeling do they have that made them cross over that line and have that confidence or that determination, perseverance to do it? And a large number, it, it goes back to the mother figures. And it's a, a really, for me, running these camps, it you know, moves this size across our country harvesting that kind of uh, data. It just intrigues me some of the uh, paradoxes that you just brushed over uh, but of the impact of parliamentarians. Yeah. And how are you going yeah. to dig deeper in that? And I'd love to yeah. track it into the future. And yeah. Learn more. yeah, there's definitely some digging to go there. So on the role modeling effect, how, how salient is one's gender above, for instance, sharing like ethnicity or like income or class background? I mean, does having a bunch of members in parliament only belong to, you know, the social majority or something have a different impact on households with with people that might not see them as a role model by their gender first? So we don't know uh, the sort of ethnic makeup of the female parliamentarians. 
it would probably not be a big stretch to say it's probably majority majority. Um, but it's a really interesting question. The the other thing that we so so in terms of the size of the effect for working moms relative to these other things, it's a very very big effect. Um, the we don't have race in there. And the reason that we don't have race is because it's it's different in every country. So um, we could go in and try to put in a um, sort of light to dark meter or some such thing. Um, but different countries have actually different questions in terms of race. So even at the individual level, we're, we're not controlling for race. And it, I certainly think it would have an effect and that it would interact with some of these things. We haven't done it. It's, that is a very messy variable. Yeah, it's just data. Great. We'd like to thank, thank Kathleen McGinn so very much. <laughs> Wonderful talk. We thank you for all your ideas. We all look forward to reading the papers, which will come out of this. And next week, Paula, who is with us today, um, will be presenting on pursuing diversity in the legal market. She's a former Women in Public Policy Program fellow, and we're always very pleased when she's able to join us. So next week, Paula. Thank you.